We're talking with NAFB Hall of Famer Cliff Mitchell as we're visiting here in Melrose, Minnesota today. And of course, uh, Cliff for many years was on KASM in nearby Albany, but this area is certainly one that he covered for quite a few years. And we're very happy to have you with us, Cliff. Now that you're retired, you tell me that uh, you're actually staying as busy or busier than you did when you were working. Well, between the honeydew list and volunteering <laughs> a little bit, well, it, it keeps you busy. Yeah. Well, let's go back. Uh, how did you get started in radio, and, and when was that? Well, I, I started in radio back in 1952, I guess it was. No, 51. Take that back. And uh, I'd always wanted to, had the idea I wanted to be in radio. There's four things I wanted to do in life. I wanted to be in radio, I wanted to be an auctioneer, a fireman, and ride rodeo, and I, I made the gamut. So you got all those things out got, of your bucket, right? Got that all bucket those list, you got, got it done. Yeah. Got it done. And uh, so then I went to radio school at uh, Brownstown in Minneapolis at that time. Our Castle Brown was running that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my uh, first assignment after I got out of Browns was KASM in Albany, and I stayed there. <laughs> I was going to leave a couple of times, but my wife, she didn't take to it too well. She was a native of the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stayed there. And, when I'd get real disgusted, I'd go down to Minneapolis about four o'clock in the afternoon and drive around a little bit, and golly, I was so glad to get back home. <laughs> well, you saw a lot of changes in radio over those years. Then. Oh, yes. Uh, we had the big tape recorders, the old magnet boxes. I'll never forget one time uh, when um, Adlai Stevenson was running for president, and I come with those two great big <laughs> cartons of his magnet boxes. I'd look worse than John carrying equipment <laughs> around, I'll tell you. And, uh, Went up to broadcast there. That was, and now we got down to, they got them no bigger than a flashlight, and yeah. makes it a lot easier. It does for traveling. Yeah. Um, when you got into radio, and did, what did you want to do? I mean, did you want to be a farm broadcaster, or actually, you uh, you appealed to a wide audience, yeah. and you did a lot of different things, yeah. didn't you, throughout your career? I don't know. I was kind of a disc jockey when I started out. That's what I was hired as, as a disc jockey, and. Uh, Played records. Uh, of course, we had the old time music, the foot stomping kind. <laughs> and uh, then it eventually, it, as the radio station grew, it, it's only been on the air uh, not quite a year when I got there. And as it grew, well, they changed the format and uh, kind of throwed some of the records aside and you did more talking. Than now, you did what I call good local radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, even as the years went by, you still did the things that really I thought, I thought made local radio so mm -hmm. good and, and, did, and did it so well with your interaction with the mm -hmm. audience, still doing live copy mm -hmm. with your uh, sponsors. Uh, tell us about how your, your show progressed and developed over the years. Well, we uh, started out and I played records and then pretty soon it cut down to five records that I played. And then it cut down to three records that I played and pretty soon there was no records. Mm -hmm. I just kept uh, talking. Uh -huh. And uh, the people of the area, they accepted me well, and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, my, you talked about leaving one of the times I was going to, when Jimmy Dean worked in Washington, D.C., uh, I had a chance to go to work for that network there, and uh, wanted to real bad, but uh, it never materialized, so I stayed in Albany. Well, worked out good for you, and it certainly worked out good for the people in this area. Um, your wife was, was and is a big part of uh, what you do. I mean, she, she was always there supporting you, and now, as you said, she keeps you busy with yeah. plenty of things to do, but I can remember seeing her at the NAFB convention over the years, and uh, she was uh, like a partner with you in, in all through your career. Well, she took the pictures and served the donut holes. That's right, the donut holes. Yeah, yeah. we remember those well. Let, let's talk about NAFB. When did you uh, join NAFB? What do you remember about uh, those early years? Uh, gee, I don't remember what year it was I joined the NAFB, but it's been quite a while ago. Um, oh, let's see. Who was president then? A fellow from um, Iowa, I think, was president I don't know when I joined. They, they had a big fuss about it when I joined because I was playing records. So uh -huh. I played a few records yet. So there were membership questions and issues oh, even yeah. then, right? Yeah, so they had a big hearing. Uh, the uh, former broadcaster at H uh, WHO, uh, Ken Ruth, he was on. He was a, one of the vice presidents at that time, 
And so we were sitting down in the hotel in Kansas City and uh, having breakfast and or lunch, I forget what it was, and he come in and says, well, they accepted you, they're gonna take you. <laughs> so that was the big word. So this would have probably been in the 80s? Oh, probably before that. Maybe Maybe late yeah, 70s, yeah, somewhere yeah. there? Um, who were, were there other broadcasters when you were getting started that you knew about or listened to or kind of were mentors or people that you looked at and said, ah, I, I like the way they do it, I, I can learn from them? Well, we had several from Minnesota at that time. Uh, Al Carstens from Albert Lee, mm -hmm. uh, who was born over at Belgrade, only 20 miles from our radio station, and uh, he was a member at that time. Uh, the fellows from Minneapolis, uh, uh, former HO, uh, not HO, uh, CCO, CCO mm -hmm. members uh, there, and uh, so we rubbed elbows a little bit and got acquainted. Of course, back then, big market radio stations, uh, they were doing agriculture programming. Yeah. Mad Farm Broadcasting oh, yeah. back then. Mm -hmm. That's your change though, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. Now, now it's, you gotta look to find a grain market to see what corn is still $7 or mm -hmm. not. <laughs> Do you get up as early as you used to? Not quite. I used to get up at, well I got up at 3.30 on my early career and then we got computers and then I had to start getting up at 2.30 to find out what was going on. <laughs> and. Uh, now I don't get up till four o'clock. We're so. always sleeping in, living yeah. a good life. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I can remember uh, going through the officer chain within AFB. It was tradition that you would interview the officers uh, mm -hmm. while we were in Kansas City for mm -hmm. the NAFB convention, which sometimes was tough because maybe we stayed out a little too late the yeah. night before and you'd get us up early next morning, but it was an honor. We all look forward to yeah. that being on your show. You, you interviewed a lot of NAFB officers. Oh, didn't you? I think everyone since uh, the second year I was in the NAFB, I started that. Got, got, kind of got that idea from Jerry Erdahl. Remember mm -hmm, Jerry, he mm -hmm. was from, uh, uh, originally from over by Litchfield, and he ended up in Wisconsin, but uh, uh, Jerry and uh, mm -hmm. his partner, they were interviewed me on the first time I was at the NAFB. And so the next year I said, well, we're gonna do this. So we uh, took donut holes and uh, the microphones from my room and got everybody up five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, food's always a good uh, yeah. way to get people there. Uh, of course, for many years, we'd cover the FFA convention while we were mm -hmm. in Can and the American Royal, yeah. along with our NAFB convention. Yeah, that used to be something you'd uh, do with that program and uh, uh, in the morning and get up and then head up to the NAFB or to the FFA convention and uh, do interviews. We had kind of a race. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the fellow used to be at Worthington, what the devil's his name? Uh, uh, anyway, well, uh, him and I would have a race to see who, who had the most interviews. And uh, the most we ever got up to, I got up to 95. Wow. That uh, you did, little spurts that you played after you got back, in other words. I can remember got Bruce Lease. Bruce, yeah, 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 Bruce. I can remember, it seems like, yeah, I can remember him doing all those interviews. It was yeah. amazing how many people he interviewed. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting. What, looking back on your career, what were some of the highlights for you? What really stood out? Oh, highlights, I guess, uh, talking to presidents and mm -hmm. governors and the hierarchy of the NAFB. And, <laughs> uh, it was all very interesting. Uh, I'll never forget one time, this is back when they run this first big power line through Minnesota, and there was a big squabble about this. They were fighting about this. So, uh, Rudy Perpich was governor at that time, and Rudy and I, we had kind of a get together. He used to call me. In fact, he was the only governor that ever sang happy birthday to me. <laughs> but he called me one morning and said, uh, can you go up to uh, uh, West, uh, Westport with me today, going up to the power line? And uh, so I was alone at the station, and so then I called the manager and, can you get somebody to cover for me? I got a chance to go with the governor. We went up there to uh, where the power line was going to be built, and uh, so we were down there, and there was a, quite a crowd around. They knew the governor was coming. And uh, about that time, here come a farmer by with a, a sidewinder spreader, spread manure, <laughs> trying to spray us. <laughs> <laughs> On purpose? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Was that to get you or the governor? Well, I guess both of us. Yeah. <laughs> I was maybe the governor. I know, yeah. I've been with you in this area. You're like yeah. a rock star here. Yeah. You had a great uh, following here yeah. and a real good, great relationship, which yeah. I think has always been 
such a special part of being a foreign broadcaster, yeah. the bond we have with mm -hmm. the audience. I, I believe that, too. It, you seem to very close. To, in fact, I volunteer at the VA one day a week now, and I meet a lot of people that come through there from the entire area that come in. Don't I know you? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, when you, especially as long as you were in the business, I mean, you generations grew up with you, so mm. uh, those kids uh, when they started having kids yeah. and then grandkids, uh, yeah. they were. Well, I was on the fourth generation about of, of kids, uh, and many times I heard 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 the kids remark. Uh, my dad always just listened to this all in the right. barn, and I couldn't stand it. I'd try to turn the radio <laughs> off, you know, and, and then he'd turn it back, and, uh, yeah. and then pretty soon, well. They grew up, and they were the ones that were turning the radio back again, and yeah. their kids were turning away. But I guess we had to the fourth generation we hit. In 2005, you were inducted into the NAFB Hall of Fame. What mm. was that like? Oh, it was a big honor, uh, something I never thought I'd do. Like, you got to be president of the <laughs> NAFB. I never did that. Uh, it was an honor to get to be in the Hall of Fame. Dix Harper just does a, a wonderful job of putting things together. You make a lot of friends in this business, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you still have them. Uh, Evan Slack, uh, a lot of people like you that uh, you've visited with and talked with. John. Mm -hmm. We spend, in this business, you spend a lot of time on the road or away from home, so those colleagues become like family in yeah. many ways. Mm -hmm. It does. You kind of share them. And, just like you here today, it's like old home week, you know. It's good to be in this area. What do we do? Uh, one, two, three, four, four of these yeah, broadcasts yeah. for AgriTalk? I was just glad to be with you because yeah. everybody wanted to come up and talk with us yeah. as long as Cliff was yeah. around. You know, you were the star here. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you look back, I mean, did it go fast uh, now that you look back on it all those years? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't realize that it was 57 years that uh, I'd been in Albany until... I started counting. Gee, uh, three months I'd have made it 57. Wow! Um, if you could do, it, if you go back and could choose a career again, would you choose to do it again? Yes, I, I enjoyed it immensely. I enjoyed the people I've met. I've uh, enjoyed the organizations that I've belonged to, the awards that I've got. Yeah. Uh, uh, just real comfortable with it. The industry's changed a lot. Um, mm. You know, some for good and some maybe not as good. We miss yeah. a lot of the things in, in the old days, but you said the advancements in technology and things yeah. like that, but it's still a people business. Isn't yeah, it, it is. Uh, being a farm director is a people business uh, uh, like yourself. Uh, AgriTalk, it's been your life and you, uh, wherever you go. And when I come in here today, what I see a couple of listeners of my, that I considered were mine right. up visiting with you and getting acquainted. I always thought the, the greatest uh, compliment that listeners could give you is when they called you their farm broadcast. You're my farm broadcast. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that personal yeah, relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, you, nobody did it better than you. It's well, good to see you again. Glad you're enjoying retirement, and uh, thanks for all that you've done uh, for the people in this area, for agriculture, and for farm broadcasting. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Cliff Mitchell, 2005 NAFB Hall of Famer.